Well, as I mentioned to the children today, we're continuing a discussion that we began last week. A discussion of Jesus, as you recall last week, of the rich young man who comes and interrupts Jesus and kneels in front of him and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, our text today immediately follows this conversation, so much so that we can still even almost see the slumped shoulders and the mournful expression of the rich young man as he walks away, having rejected the invitation of Jesus to come follow me. And it's into that context that we return. It's just after that conversation ends, we get to our first verse of today's gospel reading. Jesus looks around and says, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. The statement from Jesus is difficult for the disciples to hear. Now, at first, that may seem strange. Why would this bother the disciples? Because we know the disciples of Jesus, none of them are particularly wealthy, right? They're fishermen and tradesmen, not the sort of people that you would typically start a movement with. So why are they amazed at this statement of Jesus? Why are they amazed at His words? Well, think about it for a moment. In the disciples' day and age, someone who had great wealth was considered to be blessed by God. Even today, among our people in the church, when we have a lot of blessings, that's what we call them, right? We call them blessing. So, it's not that difficult of a leap for us to make. But it was even seen, this was even seen more than it is today during Jesus' day that wealth was considered a sign of God's favor, God's blessing. So knowing this, we can understand the reaction the disciples have a little bit better. To their ears, what Jesus might have well have said was how hard it will be for those who you think are the most likely to enter the kingdom of heaven to enter the kingdom of heaven. Maybe to feel a little bit more of their reaction, imagine in your own life, Maybe it's somebody in this room that you turn and look at and you compare yourself to them and you think, man, they're just such a much better Christian than I am. They're holier than I am. They seem to have their life together in ways that I can't begin to hope to. Now imagine Jesus referring to that person or those people and saying how difficult it will be for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's really what Jesus is saying here. And you would think that the disciples' amazement, Jesus would respond with some sort of words of comfort, but no, He reiterates the statement that He made, and He makes it even more intense, and He uses an image to drive the point home. Children, how difficult is it is to enter the kingdom of God? So, first statement, everybody, it's difficult for everyone, and then it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. An image of an impossibility, not something that you can hope to attain by working hard, but something that just can't happen. And along with this increased intensity of Jesus' words, the text tells us the disciples' amazement becomes more intense. The words it uses is that they are exceedingly astonished. And then their response comes, and you can almost hear the despair in the question they ask, then who can be saved? You can imagine their shoulders slumping and the falling of their faces just like the rich young man moments ago. And that's because Jesus' words confront them with the same impossible situation that they just witnessed in the conversation between Jesus and the rich young man. And here is how we today see the theme of both conversations is the same. Jesus' answers to the questions asked about salvation describe an impossibility. The truth is summed up fully in His words today. His response to the question, then who can be saved, with man it is impossible. Now, you may recall, as I shared with the kids and then with all of you last week, 
it's kind of uncomfortable to think about, but the more we do, the more we realize there's a lot of things outside of our control, outside of our abilities, a lot of things that are impossible for us to do. The sort of things like a camel going through the eye of a needle, not something you just need to work harder at to achieve, but something that is just beyond you, something that can't happen. And today, again, Jesus confronts us with the impossible. He says, the most gifted and blessed among us, which has just been demonstrated for the disciples in this conversation with the rich young man, will not be able to enter the kingdom of God. It is an impossible task. So what about the rest of us who aren't so gifted, who aren't so blessed, who aren't so wealthy? Is there any hope for us? Because Jesus says, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God, period. Not just for the rich person, but for all. Well, fortunately, this is precisely the question the disciples have asked Jesus in response to the revelation, one that's almost begged by the sinful human being. Well, who can be saved? You're cutting off all the avenues here, Jesus, except for one. You see, His answer doesn't stop with man, it is impossible. He continues and says, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. And here is the inflection point of today's text. This is the point where Jesus rescues His disciples and us from the despair of salvation being impossible for us. That's where He rescues us from the inevitable answer to questions like, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then who can be saved? What option is there for us when even for the first among us, it is impossible? Well, there's one option, dear brothers and sisters, and that option is Jesus. For what is impossible for the rich young man, for all who are wealthy and for the disciples, is possible with God. This is precisely what Jesus has come to do. He has come to do that which is impossible for us. Because what He's trying to teach us here is that His grace makes the impossible possible. His grace saves all those who are unable to save themselves. Now, last week, this relief wasn't so explicitly stated in the text itself, so I ended my sermon with a question a couple of questions for you to reflect on. In whose hands would you rather place the impossible things other than Jesus's? Who is more capable of dealing with those things in the best possible way? In today's text, we get an explicit answer. The answer is, there is no one better. In fact, there's no one at all other than Jesus to handle these things. Now, who are we in the text? The first answer is perhaps obvious to you that we are the disciples, imperfect human beings seeking salvation. But what might surprise you is that we are also the rich young man. Now, before you're tempted to think, hey, I'm not wealthy, wealth's a relative term. Taking my own household as an example, I looked this up online. They have a sort of a calculator for you if you put your your salary in for a year, it'll tell you how many more of the percent of the population on earth you're richer than. And on a single income household with a pastor's salary, I'm richer than 85% of people living on earth. And if we're honestly reflecting on the interaction between Jesus and the rich young man, we would similarly find his request impossible. Go sell everything you own and give it to the poor and follow me. That's part of the point. It's not something that's possible for you because you're rich or because you're poor. There are poor people who are greedy and constantly seeking after gain, and there are rich people who are not. 
But remember last week, the question was, where is your faith? For the rich young man, the faith was in his worldly wealth. And so, when he was invited by Jesus to put his faith in him, he turned away sorrowful. We're pretty similar. How anxious and afraid would you be or are you when your financial situation goes poorly and you need to rely on other people to make ends meet, to get the things that you need? How worried do you become when you're afraid you can't pay your bills or you lose your job or your home? Now, I don't think that my relative wealth would be comparable to the rich young man. There's a reason he's described that way. But I think I would find it equally impossible to sell all that I have and give it to the poor and follow Jesus. Wouldn't you? And of course, again, that makes sense because you don't have to be wealthy to feel and to put your faith in things. Rich people and poor people do it all the same. But the reason that he's focusing on the rich young ruler, the rich young man, is the blessing the perception of them being blessed serves as a specific example of the more general problem that for all, salvation is impossible to earn. See, Jesus in our text today levels the playing field when it comes to the question of our salvation. Whether we are the disciples or the rich young man, the answer is the same. It is impossible for man, male and female, rich or poor, to be saved. It's impossible for you to be saved. Let that sink in for a moment. It's not a maybe or a slim chance or just try a little harder, but no chance. This is the world according to the law of God. All are found guilty. All are found wanting. No one is good, not even one. But Jesus doesn't just level the playing field according to the law. He continues to share what levels the playing field according to a new word from God, a gospel word. Just as we are all in the same boat of despair and impossibility according to the law, we are also in the same boat of peace and life and salvation because of the gospel. For man it is impossible, but not with God. Now, at this point in the conversation, Peter pipes up, see, we have left everything and followed you. He's trying to track the conversation. It's kind of a response that makes sense. So, if what you're saying is true, Jesus, and we did it, what does that mean? It's as if Peter's saying, well, you have said that we should give up our worldly possessions and relationships. We did that, so we're good, right? Right? But Jesus' response here is important because now He's not addressing salvation in a general sense, but now He's addressing it specifically for those who have already in faith followed Jesus. Remember, this is what He offers the rich young man, but He rejects it. He does not receive him. So to Peter, Jesus' response indicates that Peter's not talking about doing things to inherit eternal life, but simply asking if the path they're on as they follow Jesus counts for salvation. And here Jesus assures those who have sacrificed for the sake of Him or the gospel, that maybe that's you, that what they have given up regarding wealth and relationships, they will receive even more now in this time and in eternity. Here Jesus refers to the blessing of the church. You might be wondering, well, if I gave up my family and my relationships, how do I get more, and not just more, but a hundredfold now in this time? Look around you. We don't just call each other's brother and sister in Christ for no reason. Remember back to Mark chapter 3, this was Jesus' teaching, what His true family is. His true family is Those who believe in His Word, our Christian brothers and sisters, are indeed 
brothers and sisters. And the second part he briefly mentions is the eternal reward to come, quote, and in the age to come, eternal life. An impossible family and an impossible life, but not with God. So, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, a core tenet of our Christian faith is, as Paul writes in Philippians, ceasing to grasp equality with God. We, through the gift of faith in Jesus, relinquish our efforts towards salvation. Instead, we can faithfully receive the work of God in Jesus that was done on our behalf. After all, can we possibly desire the salvation of our loved ones more than a God who sacrificed His own Son to save them? Can we love the stranger in need better or more than Jesus who gave up His position, His power and authority even unto death? The answer is, of course, no. There is no one better and no one able to do these impossible tasks other than Jesus. Today, as you hear these words of Scripture, despair. Despair of your own abilities and actions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The answer to that question is indeed impossible. But as you hear these words of Scriptures, even more you should rejoice. Rejoice that what is impossible for you is possible for God. Rejoice that He sent Jesus to do what you could not do. Rejoice that whatever sacrifice you make is being given back in abundance. Rejoice that He saved those who could not save themselves. Rejoice that by God's grace, Jesus makes what is impossible for us possible. Rejoice that indeed, by the grace of God in Jesus, you are saved. You are inheritors of the kingdom of God by His work and His work alone. With man, this is impossible, but not with God. For all things, including your salvation, are possible with God. In the name of Jesus, amen.